Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Biology with Mr. Amont. Today, we're going to be looking at the evidence for evolution. We are starting our new unit on evolution, and we're going to be focusing primarily today on the fossil record and fossil evidence. So our main idea for this outcome is that there's an overwhelming amount of evidence for the evolution of life on Earth. Today, we're going to look at the fossil record, but in future lessons, we're going to be looking at the other lines of evidence as well. So let's get started. The first thing we kind of have to do is define evolution. So evolution is at its most basic level. It's just going to be a, a change over time. That's it. Okay. And when we're talking about living organisms and how they're changing, we're mostly referring to the heritable characteristics of a species, which we then call biological evolution. Now, we haven't studied genetics yet. That's coming up. But when we talk about heritable characteristics, so things that you can inherit from your parents, those things are coded by genes. And we have talked about genes a little bit. And they can be transferred between generations, so from grandparents to parents, parents to uh, children, in the alleles. And we'll talk about this in the genetics unit too. So we can then discuss biological evolution as the cumulative change that occurs in a population between one generation and the next. And we're talking about the DNA. And here's your main definition that we'll be using in this class for evolution, which is it's a change in the allele frequency of a population's gene pool over successive generations. So we're looking at the genes in a population and the alleles that control traits, those alleles frequency is changing over time. That's evolution. So let's look at the first line of evolution. The first line of evolution is uh, the fossil record. So when we're talking about the evidence for evolution, we're going to mainly be showing that looking at something that's showing that there's a change in characteristics, right? So let's look at fossils. We should all probably know what fossils are. They're the preserved remains or the traces of organisms from the past. And the reason why biologists like to look at fossils is they provide direct evidence of ancestral forms. So we can visually see different species through their bones and how they may have changed over time. And they can also, some fossils can show indirect evidence. This is things like footprints, uh, tooth marks, uh, or feces, right? And through like your footprints, you'd be able to uh, tell something about like the overall size of organisms, tooth marks about change in dentation, uh, and feces maybe a change in diet. So we can, we can see how diff some changes happen through indirect lines of evidence. The direct lines are like the hard fossils. All fossils, both those that have been discovered and those that are undiscovered. Remember, we don't find every single fossil. That's referred to as the fossil record. Okay. And what the fossil record has shown us and continues to show us is that changes happen in organisms and continue to happen. And, and we call those changes in characteristics evolution. And so here's a few examples that I kind of wanted to look at. The first one, this is a picture of the spot where the first Australopithecus bose was discovered in Tanzania. So this is the spot and uh, examples of the remains of the first Australopithecus bose. This is the exact skull, the original skull of one of the very famous uh, fossils that were excavated uh, from what we call her Miss Plez, and she is a female Australopithecus africanus. And this is another very famous fossil that was excavated. This is the skeleton of Lucy. You can tell there's a lot of missing pieces here, but and that's because you know fossils aren't aren't perfect, right? Not every single bone is going to get 
mineralized properly or uh, preserved, right? So these are the ones that were preserved and you know we can, we can lay them out to where they would lie. And this is from Lucy. And she was an Australopithecus afarensis. So you can see here, we have different species, right? They're all within the genus Australopithecus. Australopithecus was a geni genus of mammals that came before the hominids. So we are a hominid, we are Homo sapiens, and there are other hominids that are extinct today, but we can see their fossils. Australopithecus is l similar to hominids. You can see their skulk looks kind of like ours. Their, their fossils here, Lucy, Lucy's fossil, looks similar to what our bone structure is. So they're not very different. They're definitely closer to us than gorillas are, but they're extinct. And so all the Australopithecus species are extinct, much like all the other hominids that used to be on earth are extinct as well. Let's talk about fossilization. So fossilization is actually very rare. Most organisms that die don't create fossils. And that's because for fossilization to actually happen, there's a lot of different conditions that have to be met. The first one is, well, you need hard body parts to fossilize. All the soft parts, they don't fossilize, right? And usually that means what has to happen is when an organism dies, all the soft parts will either uh, decay or be scavenged. And sometimes in the process of scavenging, bones can be moved around, right? But only the hard body parts actually fossilize. The next thing that has to happen is the remains have to be preserved. And so if they're just sitting on the top of the ground, they're going to be exposed to uh, erosion, right? Or damage via scavenging or environmental damage, right? Rain, wind, um, just chemical decay, right? They need to be preserved in some way. We'll talk about how that happens. They need to all then be exposed to high pressure. And this usually has to do with being buried, right? And as the weight gets uh, increased, the amount of pressure that these hard bony regions are exposed to increases, and that increased pressure can lead to mineralization of those hard parts, right? So this is turning those hard bony parts into fossilized rock. And then the last thing is, it has to be in an anoxic region which means very little to no oxygen present because the oxygen will actually damage uh, the bone structures and they'll prevent decomposition. And so we've learned about what saprotrophs are. They're a type of decomposer. We do not want saprotrophs decomposing the bones if we want fossils to form, okay? And so there's four stages of fossilization depicted in the images down here. The first phase is death and decay. And so an organism has to die for the fossils to be made. The soft body parts have to be decomposed or scavenged, right? And preferably in a way that doesn't damage the hard body parts. And also preferably in a perfect world, the bones don't get moved, right? They, they just kind of stay in the same spot. This is kind of easier to do if the only things that are decomposing or, or scavenging are very small organisms, right? Like bacteria or fungi. Um, a lot harder when you're talking about scavengers like vultures or uh, coyotes, right? Next one, deposition. So this is referring to a rapid burial. Once the soft parts get kind of removed from the bones and just the hard parts remain, the best thing to happen in terms of fossilization is for those hard parts to get covered very quickly with silt and sand, right? And then they can be covered again with new layers and new layers as wind brings in new layers and the continents shift and everything. And so that needs to happen fairly quickly. The next step is 
permineralization. And this has to do with the pressure buildup. So as the layers of sediment keep getting deposited on top of your fossil, the pressure that they exert through the sheer weight of all that material is going to cause the hard bone-like things to be replaced by minerals. The last stage is erosion or exposure. And so what ends up happening is there's a movement of tectonic, tectonic plates, right? And these can displace the fossils and return it to the surface. If we don't discover it before that time, the fossil gets exposed and will then erode and disappear, right? So fossils don't last forever just because of the way the earth works and the movement of tectonic plates. Uh, and this is something that you would have learned in previous years, right? One plate sliding under another or on top of another, etc. Okay. Let's talk about the time scales that this all happens. So we know that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old. And we know that the earliest forms of life kind of started popping up 3.5 billion years ago. And we talked about this in previous lessons. Because the time scales are so big, what geologists and biologists tend to do is come up with names for time periods where specific species existed because the life that exists on earth at any moment on the evolutionary clock is different right there's been hundreds of mass extinctions millions and of little minor extinctions right and species evolve and change over time so if we zoomed in at what the earth looked like at four o'clock which is roughly when insects started to appear this world would be drastically different than the world that we're looking at right now, which is much closer to like midnight, right? And remember, this is taking the entire 4.6 billion years and condensing it into 12 hours, right? Where one hour is basically 570 million years, okay? So let's look at some words. We have epochs which are the shortest unit of time scale that uh, evolutionary biologists or geologists kind of talk about. And in my geological pyramids diagram here, we don't have any epochs because they're, they're usually only a couple million years and they're only used in terms of describing short-lived uh, species, right? Species that maybe didn't live through the in entire Jurassic period. So the next one, Many different epochs can be grouped together into a period. And now you will know, you will have probably have heard of the names of some periods, like the Jurassic period, right? Jurassic Park or Triassic or Cretaceous, uh, Carboniferous, the Cambrian explosion. These are very famous periods in terms of Earth's history, right? And some of these you've probably heard about. So these are periods many different epochs fall within the Triassic period. Now you can see here that the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, they're kind of lumped together into this Mesozoic. And this Mesozoic is an era. So periods are combined to make a subdivision called an era. So the Triassic period is within the Mesozoic era. Same with the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. These three periods are all part of the Mesozoic era. The Tertiary and Quaternary periods are part of the Cenozoic era. And then finally, you have what we call the largest division of geological time, and that's an eon. Eons are the largest division of geologic time. And so if we look at this chart and you have the Paleozoic, which has one, two, three, four, five, six different periods, and the Mesozoic, which has three, and the Cenozoic, which has two, all 11 of these periods fall within the Phanerozoic eon. 
Okay? So when you hear biologists, geologists, or evolutionary biologists uh, using these words, eons, periods, eras, epochs, just know they're scales of time. Eons are very large scales of time, sometimes hundreds of millions of years. Periods are shorter. Era, uh, sorry, eras are shorter than eons. Periods are shorter than eras. And epochs are usually the smallest, maybe just a few uh, million years. Let's talk about how we know how old fossils are. So one of the best ways to determine how old a fossil is, is to use something called radioactive dating, which sometimes is referred to as absolute dating. And this is something that if you've taken Physics 30 with me, you'd be a little bit more familiar with this. And that has to do because radioactive dating, what we're doing is comparing the ratio of radioactive isotopes in fossils, okay? And radioisotopes are basically isotopes that are formed from something that has a new number of protons. And this is something we'll get into in Chem 30 and Physics 30 if you haven't taken those classes yet. And what we want to know, what, we, what I want you to know for Bio 30 is that radioisotopes are generally very unstable and they decay at a constant rate. This is really, really important. So there's three types of decay. Alpha decay, beta decay, and gamma decay. And again, you'll learn about these in Chem and Physics 30. We're not gonna go into them in too much detail here. But there's a bunch of different types, three different types, not a bunch, of, ra of radioactive decay, and they work in different ways, right? Alpha decay produces alpha particles, right? Beta decay produces beta particles, and gamma decay produces gamma particles. And they work in different ways. But the thing that's similar between them is that the rate of decay is the same. And that's what we're kind of going to focus on here. Because when we're doing radioactive dating, we're talking about using that information, the fact that decay happens at a constant rate. And that rate, what we're, what we're going to be looking for is the half-life, okay? So we know that radioisotopes de decay at a constant rate. And th we then say that the time it takes for half of those isotopes to decay, that's the half-life. And this is something in Physics 30, you would have done a lot of different calculations for half-lives of, uh, well, just elements, right? Radioactive elements. Let's talk about how it's used for short range dating. So short range dating is like less than 60,000 years old. That's the maximum. And for short range dating, things that uh, are less than 60,000 years old, what we're looking at, the, the isotopes that we're looking at are carbon 12 and carbon 14. Carbon 12 is stable. Carbon-14 is not, it's radioactive. And so when an organism dies, the carbon-12 doesn't decay and the carbon-14 does. And so half, half of the carbon-14 will disappear in carbon-14's half-life, which the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years. So every 5,730 years, half of the carbon-14 is gone. So if I look at the first half-life here, half of the carbon is gone. How much time elapsed here between these? 5,730 years. After another 5,730 years, we're now down to 25% of our carbon, and then 12.5%, etc. Every half-life, every 5,730 years, half of our carbon-14 disappears. But what happens to the amount of carbon-12? Nothing. It stays the same. It's not radioactive. So what we're able to do is compare the two, right? If I have only, I look at the carbon-12 and I have like, let's do something silly, like 100 grams of carbon-12, okay? Okay. 
And then I look at the carbon-14 and I measure it out to be uh, 12.5 grams. How much time would have passed? Well, 12.5 would be three half-lives, right? If I started with 100 and I'm now down to 12.5, three half-lives would have occurred. If each half-life is roughly 6,000 years, that means 18,000 years have passed. And of course, I'm, I'm doing some rounding, right? Because I'm not going to take out a calculator for this, but I'm just demonstrating how we can tell the age of something based off this. Now, one thing to be aware of is as we increase our number of half-lifes, what happens to our amount of carbon-14? It gets significantly smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why we only tend to do this up to this 60,000 year mark. If it's older than that, then dating via carbon-14 is not going to give us a, really an estimate of how old that thing is, right? It doesn't really work. We don't have enough carbon-14 left to actually measure. And so then we're gonna get into long-range dating. And with long-range dating, this is gonna work a little bit differently. Right? What we're doing is we're dating the rocks around the fossil. And that's because the carbon-14 within the fossil, there's not enough of it to test. Right? And there's no other really radioactive elements within the fossil that is useful to test. So we're going to look at the rocks that surround the fossil because the way fossilization happens is those rocks would have been deposited roughly at the same time as the fossil if they're directly around the fossil, right? So this, there's a bit more restrictions. We can only do this on igneous rock, not on the fossils themselves. And we also can't do it on sedimentary rocks in which they're found. So only if they've been covered by igneous rock can we do this type of dating. And what we're looking at is K40, which is potassium 40. And the reason we look at potassium-40 is potassium-40 is released in lava from active volcanoes. And potassium-40 is radioactive. It decays into argon-40. Okay, And it has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. So between this 0 and 1 here, this is now 1.3 billion years. So this is much longer term dating, right? <clears throat> and argon, one thing to remember is you might say, well, maybe the argon came from somewhere else, right? But argon is an inert gas, right? So during the volcanic eruption, the only place that the, like volcanoes, yes, they do release argon, right? But the argon is a gas it would have risen out. The argon-40 could have only come from the decay of potassium-40. And so that's why we use that as our indicator. Okay, so this is long-range dating for things that are more than 60,000. And there's other types of dating methods that are used, but we're not gonna go into them. We're mostly just gonna focus on radioactive dating as one of the methods of determining how old a fossil is. But there are other, are other ways to do that. Let's talk about fossil succession. So we know that there's going to be different layers of rock, right, that are deposited over time, right? So layer A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And we often call this stratus. And in different stratus and different layers, we're likely gonna find uh, fossils from species that lived in the time that those layers were deposited, right? And they're generally deposited, deposited chronologically, meaning the older the deposit is, the further down it is, right? So we have uh, this layer of rock deposited 50 million years ago, and then 49 million years ago, another deposit, right? Etc. And within each layer, we're gonna find generally the same species. Right. So if we look at this layer A, we're going to be very it's, it's very likely that we're going to find trilobites and ammonites. We would not find trilobites in layer E. Why? Because this layer was deposited 
probably hundreds of million years after trilobites existed, right? They're only going to be found in layer eight. And so we kind of talked about this. And one thing to note is things arrive in the fossil strata or in the strata, fossils arrive in, the, in it in predictable ways, right? Our prokaryotes are going to be the oldest things, the ones furthest down in our, in our, in our rock layers. Ferns are going to be kind of next, right? Invertebrates later, vertebrates later. Flowering plants come after ferns, right? It's, it's predictable. And so one thing that biologists like to do is this look and so we can see here here's our fossil sequence for our animal phyla we have shelled invertebrates arriving in the cambrian and we can find them in rock strata that was deposited during the cambrian period in the ordovician we start to get fish and really it kind of happens right in the middle but usually we'll find fish starting off in this and then of course there's fish that live today right so this line ink goes all the way up to modern era right amphibians started appearing in the devonian reptiles in the carboniferous mammals in the triassic birds in the jurassic and man much later in the tertiary right what do you notice about the complexity of species? Well, they're getting more complex over time, right? And this is one of the things that we like to talk about in evolution is in general, species become more complex over time as species become more adapted to their environments. We can do the same thing with plants, right? Algae are the oldest. They're also the simplest. Bryophytes started appearing in the Silurian and they're a little bit more complex than algae. Philokinophytes, ferns, started appearing in the Devonian and they're a bit more complex than bryophytes. And we're gonna look at the differences between these groups more in the classification unit. Gymnosperms or conifers, things that produce cones, started arriving in the Triassic and angiosperms, which are flowering plants, arrived in the Jurassic, right? And so we can th see that at, over time species got more complex and we're gonna look at these complexities in the uh, classification unit, but you can definitely see it in terms of how they reproduce, right? Algae uh, reproduce asexually, bryophytes, same thing. They start to produce spores, philokinophytes uh, also have spores, but they also have a vascular system now. Gymnosperms uh, have pollen grains within the, the cones right? And there's male and female cones. So definitely a lot more complex. And then angiosperms also have pollen, but now not in cones. They're in flowers and the pollen's actually just released into the wind or they are symbiotic with things like bees or, or birds that help to distribute the pollen. Let's look at uh, transition species. So in the fossil record, we have things called transition fossils. And transition fossils are really interesting because they demonstrate intermediary forms, right? So we have this species, this is a very popular one, the Archaeopteryx. And this species is a link between something that had jaws and claws, so in the dinosaur range, and something that had more similar now to birds, where we can see its feathers, right? So this is a species that lived in the time between dinosaurs and, and birds and has examples of both kind of things, right? We can see the feathers and it has jaws and claws, much like its reptilian dinosaur ancestors. So this is a transition species. Now we don't have transition species for everything. These are very rare, but this is a very, very um, famous kind of fossil, the Archaeopteryx fossil. 
let's go to uh, talking about kind of humans now. So there is fossil evidence for human evolution. And what we're going to be kind of looking at in the next few slides here is comparing Australopithecus. So we, at the beginning, we looked at three different species that fall within the genus Australopithecus. And we're going to be comparing them to our bone structure, Homo sapiens. And we're going to talk about the reasons why it might happen. So one of the main differences, well, let's, let's, let's maybe do this one at a time. So actually, here's an Australopithecus. Here's an Australopithecus, and here's our fossils. You can see, hopefully, some similarities between the two, right? The first thing we're going to kind of look at is the first feature, which is the change from Australopithecus to Homo sapiens. One of the things that changed is our face is much flatter. If you look at the fossils of Australopithecus, they have much like their their jaw lines come out right it's not quite so flat and so what could have caused the more downward facing foramen magnum and the reduced brow ridge so the like where your eyebrows are it's reduced and your jaws don't protrude as much you know how dogs their jaws come out well australopithecus they're not quite like dogs where they have a big muzzle, but there is definitely a little bit of protrusion there, whereas our face is relatively flat. Why would that have changed? That has to do completely with us changing into becoming bipedal, right? Which is walking upright and not using our hands. Okay. Let's look at the next one. Is the narrower jaw, right? And again, this the narrow jaw, smaller teeth and narrower jaw, this had to do with a change in our diet, right? We started eating more meat. We became uh, hunters rather than gatherers, right? Started working in groups to hunt for our game. Next one, you can see the difference between the chest here. In humans, our chest is more shaped like a barrel, whereas here it's kind of V-shaped, right? Why would that have happened? Where is that? Oh, that's not on here. But that would have been uh, just a result of the change in our organ structures, right? Increased size of uh, some organs, decreased size in others. S-shaped spine. So this is kind of a big one. So your S-shaped spine has to do with walking upright, right? As species, as humans, well, just hominids, not humans. As hominids started to become bipedal and walking on two feet, their spine had to change to support that increased weight due to gravity, right? Because we're no longer on four legs. And that caused a change in the curvature of the spine. The next one is the broader pelvis. The broader pelvis has to do with changing birthing pat patterns. Our infants started getting larger and less frequent. We didn't produce as many children over short periods of time. Instead, we invested our energy on less frequent children and larger children and that led to more reproductive success for us. Next one, a longer arm to leg ratio. You can see the difference between them here, a lengthening in the arms and legs. What did this have to do with? Again, hands, like we're, no, we're now manipulating tools, we're reaching for things, we're walking on two legs so we need stronger leg bones. Uh, it's, you know, all these changes that have to do with going from walking on four limbs to walking on two, that's what caused those changes. And then the heel bones, you can see they're much larger in hominid species. 
And again, those larger heel bones and the alignment of the big toe has to do with bipedalism, right? Other things that weren't on the images, the hominids have much less hair, right? And that's because we started using clothing and also sexual selection. And we have a much larger cranial capacity. It's because we started doing things like communicating and kind of thinking in new ways, right? Manipulating tools. Uh, so our cranial capacity increased. Same with our, uh, the density of our brains. And average height and size. The reason why there's a big difference between like these two in terms of height and size is we have a better diet, right? We're eating meat, there's more nutrition in meat, all the essential proteins are there. That was what happened. We have another example here and horses and you can see the change in horses over time into from something that looked a bit more like a dog and you can see the change in their skulls here. Change in the skulls, lots of these features can be uh, caused by change in diet, right? And change in habitat or environment as the species became adapted to eating different types of plants, right? And here you can see the change in their, their leg and feet bones into something that had like from three toes into something that has a hoof-like structure. And these, you will find uh, more detailed explanations in your textbook. Last thing we're gonna kind of talk about is, and many of you are probably thinking, well, there's gaps in the fossil record, right? Not everything becomes a fossil. Only the hard parts are preserved. Fossils can be damaged, missing, eroded, right? We don't have fossils for every single species that ever existed because some of them were short-lived and just fossil remains haven't been preserved or we just haven't found them yet, right? So the fossil record itself is incomplete. It's not the best line of evidence for evolution. But just because it's not the best line of evidence for evolution doesn't mean it's not strong evidence. When it comes to dating fossils found within rock strata, using radiometric data and other means, it's actually very accurate. We know exactly how old those fossils are. We also are able to determine how species changed over time by comparing fossils of uh, like species, species within the same genus, uh, and observing how they may have adapted to their changing environments over long periods of time. There are other evidences for evolution, and that's what we're gonna be getting into next lesson. See you then. Thanks for watching, everybody. You can like, follow, and subscribe to my social medias to get notifications as soon as new content is uploaded. In the top corner here, you will find the playlist that this video is in. Watch the unit from beginning to end, and over here, you will find the next video in this unit. Keep learning, everybody. Take care.